All right, folks, welcome back. 10x programmer, ninja, rock star, we've all heard the terms. I've been really curious to find out where this idea of the 10x programmer originated. So I went on a hunt through the literature to find out where this idea was first proposed and how it made its way through to us today. And what I found was that this is a prime example of what I would call a citation snowball, which means that there was an original paper and then it got cited many, many times with just the punchline and none of the caveats or critiques or shortcomings of the original study. And then it became this folkloric thing that we today refer to as the idea of the 10x programmer. So this paper right here, this is ground zero for this idea of the 10x programmer. This was published back in 1968 in the communications of the ACM. And from the title, you wouldn't even guess that this paper has anything to do with programmer productivity. The goal of this paper was to distinguish the performance of programmers when they were working on online versus offline systems. These are the very earliest computers. Batch programming was still in vogue. Online interactive time-sharing computers had just started appearing. And the big question for a lot of computer installations was whether they should convert their batch processing operations to time-shared interactive operations. The problem was that these new time-sharing systems were much more expensive. And the hope was that if they converted over to using them, they would see benefits in programmer productivity. So that's what this paper tries to establish. Are programmers more productive when they move from a batch system to an interactive time-sharing system? The authors performed two separate experiments, one with experienced programmers, those who had more than seven years experience programming, and another one with novice programmers. For the set of experienced programmers, they found a group of 12 programmers, and they were given two problems to solve, an algebra problem where they had to solve some equations, and a maze problem where they were given a maze as a 20 by 20 array and had to find a path through the maze. The primary thing that they were measuring was not coding time, but debugging time. The coding phase was still done offline, and coding was considered to be complete when the program passed through the compiler without any errors. That's when debugging time started, and debugging time was considered to be complete when the program executed on its test inputs without any errors. This won't come as a huge surprise, but what they found was that programmers of the online system were between 50% and 300% faster than programmers on the offline system. But also in passing, and this is where the idea of the 10x programmer really originated, they noticed that there were large individual differences between the productivity of this set of programmers. For example, the time taken to debug the algebra problem had a ratio of 28 to 1 between the poorest score and the best score. We will see that in this entire table, we see similar ratios of 20s to 1 tens to one in many important metrics like debug hours or coding hours or even how fast the program ran. It is this data that was seized upon by a lot of the subsequent citations of this paper that gave birth to the idea of these wide order of magnitude differences between programmer productivity. Note that these ratios are between the worst and the best. It is a very common misconception that these ratios are between the average and the best. 
And as a result of this data, what the authors are proposing is that if we could only weed out all these bad programmers and keep these superstar great programmers, our projects would move much, much faster. We should be measuring programmer productivity so that we can weed out the low performers continuously. So just taking this at face value, there are several problems with this approach. First of all, the n value of 12 is way too small to draw any general conclusions about programmer productivity. The other big issue is that this does not take into account all the other activities that a modern programmer has to do to be an effective one. It does not take into account teamwork or communications or dealing with ambiguity. Be that as it may, this paper was cited by the 1968 NATO report on software engineering. And from there, this idea really spread like wildfire. It eventually made its way into Fred Brooks's famous book, The Mythical Man Month. And by now, this idea is widespread in the programming community. In 1981, 13 years after this original paper by Sackman, Thomas Dickey published a paper in Proceedings of the IEEE that took a much closer and critical look at the data from the original paper. He pointed out several issues with the way the sample of programmers was chosen. It turned out that some of the programmers wrote their programs in machine language whereas others wrote it in a high-level language similar to Algol. That is a very important detail. Some of them had not used time-sharing systems before, and one of the most cited numbers from the paper, which is the ratio of 28 is to 1 between the worst and best debugging times, it turns out the subject that took 170 hours wrote it in machine language in a batch environment and the subject who solved that in six hours wrote it in a high level language in a time sharing environment. So this is a really skewed comparison. And the author here finds that after eliminating these differences, only about a five to one variability in programmer productivity remains. He laments some of the wide citation of the paper by Sackman, where this idea is then cited without taking into account all the critiques of the data and of the sample set. So that was a look at how the idea of the 10x programmer came to be. I hope you enjoyed that. And I will see you next time. Thank you very much.